we're extremely, extremely grateful to have uh, Jen over here with us. Jen is not only a vet, she's also a uh, college mate of mine back in uh, RVC, back in uh, graduated 2004. But more importantly, she's also uh, into a lot of talking about sustainable living and she has also uh, published a book called Sustainably-ish so to speak. And so today, we are very grateful to have uh, Jen on board with us to discuss about her life, her journey as a vet and what she's doing now. Hello, Jen. Hello, lovely to be here. Thank you. So Jen, tell me the most classic question. Why do you become a vet? Uh, probably like a lot of us, I think I just decided at about 15, maybe even earlier, I wanted to be a vet. Um, Probably subconsciously from, you know, James Herriot. He's got a lot to answer for, hasn't he? Watching All Creatures Great and Small. Um, and yeah, just kind of stuck at it and uh, um, had a Saturday job at a local vet and, you know, did all the work experience and things and, and um, got there. So, yeah. Good. And at RVC, what was vet college like? Was it what you expected? Sort of what sort of challenges did you face? during your years in uh, study? Um, oh, yeah, I don't know if it was what I, I don't really know what I was expecting. I think, I don't, I don't know if you know, like I started in, when did I start? 98, I think, and then I dropped out and I, so I ended up kind of back in your year after. Right. Um, and, I, and I remember when I dropped out thinking, oh, I could go and do a biology degree. And I was like, Oh, the thought of sitting in a lab and like, you know, pipetting things from one thing to another or whatever, or I could be outside watching a lameness workup. And I was like, I'd probably rather be sat outside watching a lameness workup. So I'll go back and <laughs> go back and do it. But um, I didn't have the smoothest journey through vet college at all. Um, had a lot of mental health issues and really um, struggled quite a lot, I think. Um, and I don't, I don't know what it's like at college now, but I think it's something that I personally didn't find a huge amount of support for. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind if we dig a little bit deeper over there? What mm -hmm. do you mean by mental health issues? Like, was there anything that was incited by the course itself or was it personal life or? No, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it was the stress of kind of having to get, you know, certain A-level grades and things like that. I ended up with um, sort of depression and eating disorders and things like that, which I think in the profession are, relatively common and when you're looking at especially you know a, a profession that is um, a high percentage of women and high achieving women so you know I think eating disorders probably are quite prevalent um, there's a big um, drinking culture at college I don't know if there still is but there certainly was when we were there um, you know and I kind of got sucked into that as well so for me it wasn't a very mentally healthy place to be. Mm. And uh, how did you overcome those uh, challenges? Because uh, obviously you qualified, which is by no means an easy feat, despite <laughs> all these issues. Yeah, I do. I do look back and I wonder how I qualified. I, d I don't know about you. I have a recurring dream that I haven't qualified and that I'm, you know, I've still got to sit finals. And I'm like, oh god. Um, I. So yeah, I was I was quite unwell through the whole of the time I was at college, and then um, graduated and got my first job and met my now husband um, and he encouraged me to get some therapy and things and so it's been it's been a long old process I would say um, but yeah lots of lots of therapy lots of um, and you know supportive kind of family and other half as well. Mm. And how did you find um, your first job? God did my first job it? was a nightmare. <laughs> I am um, I it was it was small animal and equine and it was only me and my boss and I kind of thought oh this will be really good because she'll be really invested in supporting me and providing me with lots of help and things and she was a complete pisshead and she um she would I, I think it was like the first bank holiday weekend I was like there on my own and like ringing her up and I had to do a, a splenectomy and I was like ringing her up going um I, I, I don't I think I've got to do a splenectomy. Oh, right. So just make sure you ligate all the vessels. I'm like, no, no, no. I need you to come back. <laughs> um, so, it, and, and I think some people would really relish that depending on their personality. Some people would love that. And I remember speaking to, to friends and them going, oh, it's amazing today. I got to do X, Y, and Z. Whereas, you know, my personality type in hindsight isn't 
isn't that I think you know I, I'm someone who likes a lot of hand-holding and a lot of um, reassurance and stuff so it was completely the wrong job for me <laughs> how long did you stay in that job just over a year I think then after that then I went to uh, a, a solely small animal practice um, but again you know I was promised lots of support and lots of um, the uh, there was a, a more experienced vet there and um, but again, I just ended up in situations where I was having to like do an amputation without having having done one and I'm there on my own. And I know loads of people do that and cope really well with it. And I just mm. didn't at all. Um, so I, I had a, uh, you know, I, I, to be honest, I never really enjoyed vetting. I found it massively stressful. Mm. I, um, mm. you know, never particularly enjoyed surgery. Mm. Be doing on call and just that whole mm. sick feeling when the phone goes and, um, so, you know, I, I, I still love the idea of being a vet. I just don't like the reality of it. <laughs> that is very, very interesting you say that because, like you said, you read James Herriot, watched a TV program, got inspired at that. Similar, very similar to myself, you know, back in Singapore, you remember reading James Herriot, I'm like, wow, okay. And after that, coming to reality, and you realised that the reality wasn't as similar as the book. Mm. What, what, what are your thoughts about that, about James Herriot, really? I mean, that's the reason why so many of us became vets, but how real, how realistic it is for people with that same notion, because I can just see the youngsters these days, they read James Herriot, they're like, okay, look, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that was a whole different era, wasn't it? And a whole different, um, I mean, vetting is a vocation anyway, but that was, do you know, he was on call like 24 seven, wasn't he? Like, mm. but I guess the, the probably the, the, maybe their client list was lower so that, you know, fewer um, things. I would imagine less um, pressure on him in terms of, um, you know, it was a genuinely kind of mixed practice mm. thing, wasn't it? You could have a go at everything. Um, probably expectations much, much lower in terms of um, mm. certainly, I would imagine, surgery and small animals mm. and things like that. And mm. um, it just feels like a very different world. I think the, mm. the, the veterinary profession, certainly when I was in, I haven't practiced for, um, trying to think, at least four or five years now. But, you know, it, it felt that the weight of expectation felt very, very high. And I, and again, I, maybe that's just my personality type, but I found it very difficult to say to clients, um, okay, so, you know, I, I felt like this, I was expected to get a diagnosis on a clinical exam, yes. you know, and sometimes you can't. And, and then I would feel guilty and responsible because I couldn't do that. And like, I wasn't a good enough vet because I couldn't do that. Yes. And then I'd say, well, you know, you're going to have to pay for bloods and we can do this set of bloods, which may or may not give us the results and they're this much and this set of results which have got this set of bloods which have more chance of giving us the right results but they're more money but they still might not give us the answer it's really hard i really struggled mm. with it mm. yeah it's almost as though you are made to give confirmations uh, either yes or no in a situation where there is a it's not black and white and you're expected to give black and white answers in all the 50 shades of gray so to speak yes so that is uh, challenging and um, you were saying something earlier about a you were promised support in your first and second job but you didn't mm. receive that do you think that is quite commonplace that you know people think they're going to get support but they don't and you know what, what, what are your thoughts about that I, I I didn't feel hugely well supported but like I said that some of that was probably on me and feel and needing a higher level of support mm. Um, I think in hindsight, had I gone and done an internship or something like that, that probably would have suited me much more. Uh, anecdotal evidence, I think it is quite an issue within the profession. And I think it's something that the profession needs to needs to really look at. And I know that there's the, the new grad scheme and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I kind of feel that there's a duty of responsibility. If you're going to take on a new grad, mm. um, that you do that in the knowledge that, yes, you get to pay them less, but you have to invest a hell of a lot more in other ways in 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 you know in support in checking in with them in seeing how they're doing not just mm. clinically but kind of mentally and it's a big transition going from uni where you're surrounded by all your mates every day to to being on your own and being a proper grown up in practice yeah why why do you think it is such that because obviously the bosses that we used to work for or we work for before they would have gone through the similar sort of transition that we have gone through, i.e. they were fresh grad ones. Mm. And so whatever struggles that they face, um, 
why would they not want to address those issues that they know that people will face? But that seems to be a recurring theme yeah. in the vet industry. What, what, what yeah. are your thoughts about that? I don't know if it's, if it's an age thing. You know, if you think some of these, some of the vets who are now bosses graduated 20, 30, maybe even 40 years ago, and maybe it was different then. Maybe it was, having said that, was it, it's nearly 20 years since we graduated, isn't it? <laughs> it wasn't that different then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, I think there certainly was a mentality of kind of the whole, you know, see one, do one, teach one, and you just get out there and you get stuck into it. And um, I, I, I honestly don't know why, whether you just forget, like how terrifying it is, um, whether we just see what we want to see and we think, well, they seem like they're doing okay. And, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're not in tears um, or I don't see them in tears, so they must be okay. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I feel like that... Uh, that there's from my experience as I said you know 15 years ago there was a lot of work that needed to be done I think I think the profession has taken that on board and I know that there's a lot more investment in um you know coaching and all those kinds of things for for vets and um I hope that's really helping some of our new graduates just uh, elaborating on your on, on this topic and I'd like to find what your insight is really it's like a you know the rate of, or rather the amount of depression, it's getting quite high in the vet mm. uh, profession. And we know that because uh, Vet Life, the equivalent for Samaritan for Vets, um, has published to say that their calls, their, their calls for vets asking for help uh, in terms of supportive help, uh, mental health has doubled in the past few years. So every year it doubles. Yeah. And also the sort of dropout rate, the attrition rate of uh, vets drop out in the speeds, they recorded sort of a 38% of vets oh. would drop out two years ago. Uh, two years ago, they reported 38%. So more than a third of vets would drop out, would leave the profession if they oh. report it. And also we know the suicide rate is pretty high, whereby we are twice more likely to end our lives compared to the uh, to compared to the medical profession and four times more likely compared to the general public. Mm. Um, but the irony of it is that I find myself, I'm not sure whether you get the same experience with me. When I tell people I'm a vet, a people, the, the members of public will go, wow, I love that job. I always wanted to be a vet. Yes, yeah. It must be such a cool job working with animals every day. That's my dream job. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm thinking, it's such a dream job. Why are we having such statistics that is quite alarming? Yeah. And uh, so this question is two parts to it. One is, why do you think we have those sort of statistics? And number two, why do you think the public has that complete misconception uh, <laughs> of what our life is actually like? What, yeah. what are your thoughts, Jen? Um, so the first one was um, why we have such high rates of depression and suicide. And um, I mean, people will have done studies into this. My gut feeling is that we almost pre-select for that because of the mm -hmm. grades that are required. I remember not long after graduating, my old flatmate went back to, to be on one of the interview panels for, for vet college. And she was like, not a chance we would get in now. These people have done their gold Duke of Edinburgh. They've rescued a person. They've climbed this, per you know, and they've got three A stars or whatever. So, so we're, because of the demand for places, I guess we're kind of, and, and the emphasis that's put on academic achievement and mm. we're kind of pre-selecting for people who are very, driven very perfectionist very and i'm not a psychologist but i'm assuming that, that those are all traits that contribute to um to uh, sort of mental illness and things like that um as i said we have a um you know very high percentage of um women in the profession and i don't know what the depression rates are um mm. in the general public um differences between men and women but i am um, I think probably one of the, the big reasons for for dropout will be that lack of flexibility sometimes around family and working and and there's there's quite a lack of career structure isn't there unless you you go down the academic route and you're an intern and then you're a resident and then you're um you know you, you kind of are just flung out into the world into general practice and then if you want to you can do a certificate it might might or might not benefit you financially um and if you <laughs> let us go no it doesn't um you know and then and then your option is to earn, own a practice well a lot of people might not want to own a practice and might mm -hmm. want, want that responsibility and things but there's kind of nowhere for them to go and, and you've mm -hmm. got this this job that is on the one hand 
um, very stressful, very emotional. Um, and then on the other hand, can be quite mundane and dull. Do you know, you're not really using your brain um, and, and doing all these sort of in-depth workups and cool things you did at college because maybe people can't afford it or there's no time to take and all those sorts of things. So it's like a really weird mesh of lots of things, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts about the general public uh, having the misconception of what our job is like? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's funny because even, you know, Friend, now I say, you know, I'm no longer practicing. Oh, why would you give that up? Oh my God, you trained for, <laughs> everyone says seven years, don't they? You trained for seven years, what a waste. And I'm like, you have no idea. It's, you know, the, and then when you sort of say to them, oh, you know, well, you, you have to be on call. And you, and I know there's a lot of practices now where you don't have to be on call, but mm. I, 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 I still can't find a way to explain it to somebody else. I still can't find a way to explain how, stressful it was and how miserable it made me um i think there's this when you one of the things i struggled with was the fact that you know you, if you go to your gp as a as a person they you know have a limited remit as to what they can do before they refer on as a as a general practitioner in veterinary medicine you're expected to be um you know a clinician um, a, a surgeon, a radiographer, an ultrasonographer, you know, all of these things, and you're expected to do them all bloody well. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's huge. That's a lot. And then you're also expected to do it all pretty much for free as well, because people are going to whinge at you about how much it costs. And people, yeah, I think people, obviously, you know, we see our pets as family and um, whether it, yeah, I don't know really hard in your experience do you think the high expectation is set upon by us the vet profession that we think we need to do so well or is it really by the public i.e if i were to say that actually i have to refer you for that would the public look at us every differently uh, uh, any differently to say that actually yeah that's normal because that's what a gp does or do you think the public would say uh you're such a rubbish vet <laughs> So, it, you know, is the ex high expectation, was it set by us or is it set by the public in your experience? I think it's changing, isn't it? As we become, um, I remember when I was first, you know, a Saturday girl in, in practice, so longer ago than, than I care to think, um, you know, they, they would just be this sort of bog standard little um, practice and they'd be doing surgery that we would now routinely refer to for, you know, they'd, they'd be doing um, orthopedic stuff, they'd be doing, you know, and in, in not a particularly sterile environment and 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 I think there was this kind of um have a go attitude or this you know that there wasn't the potential to easily refer things so so you just sort of got on and did it otherwise there wasn't another option whereas now I think there are it is so much easier to refer things we have um hopefully a lot of people have their pets insured and they have the the ability to do that so it's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing I think because there will be some vets who will love to do that he will have a um you know a, a certificate in surgery and still be in general practice and will love to do all these things and um, but there will be other vets like me who are who are kind of crafting themselves to do that um so it's it's and it's very difficult to you know there's there's almost i guess no um standard of like you know this if you go to your general practice vets this is what you can expect because everybody will be offering different things mm. um, thanks for that so you were talking about doing things for free. So I want to touch on that a little bit. So it is also not unusual when you say that, when I say that I'm a vet, uh, the comments I get will be, wow, you must be rolling it in. You must be so well off. And I sort of cringe to think that, you know, two years ago, same again, Spivs, they came up with a survey to say 58% of vet practices in UK, both corporate and independent, their profit margins is actually below average between seven and 10%, which means that, Every 120 pounds we charge, 20 pounds goes to VAT, and you actually only take minus all the overheads, you only take home seven to 10 pounds, which is not a very high profit margin. So why do you think, first of all, a simple question, do you think that medicine is uh, profitable? And secondly, why do we get a misconception that it is from the general public? Yeah. I, I would struggle to comment on is it is it profitable as a practice having never been like a practice owner. Um, I certainly know that um, 
Or what, sorry, um, or what about just salary base? So you're not talking yeah, about... Yeah, I don't, it's not um, commensurate with, or, it, you know, it doesn't match equivalently qualified professions like lawyers, like doctors, like dentists, mm. um, in any way, shape or form, it was my experience. Um, and although you might start off at a similar level at graduation, mm. I think because they've got, um, you know, very tiered career paths and things like that, then, then I think they can probably climb and, and get to much higher levels. Mm. But it's, it's weird, isn't it? This perception that, um, that vets are expensive when a lawyer can write a letter that they've probably just printed a temp, you know, they've got a template of, and that's like 120 quid. Mm. And it, yes, everybody whinges about it, but mm. this, but then, yeah, it, it is really strange. And I don't know why the perception is that, um, to be a vet, you'll be, you'll be really rich, whether it comes back to, you know, years ago when the, I don't, I don't know. Was it easier to make money years ago? Was it, you know, um, the, the generation of vets that have just retired, was it easier for them to build their practices and to actually be taking home a decent salary as a, as a partner? I don't know. Um, you know, now there's, there's much more, um, people are invested in corporate, you know, and, and sort of, um, are sort of affiliates or partners within them. And, and so you need a smaller investment, but you probably get a smaller payout and chunk and things, don't you? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know why the perception is that you'll be, maybe it's because you're a professional and they, they assume that you're on the same mm -hmm. wage structure kind of as um, the rest of the professionals. I like your take on this. If you had a, if it was one of the, like, like you said, so I've sort of identified four different issues of um, high depression rate, high dropout rate, high uh, suicide rate, and low profit margins. And if you had a magic wand, how would you, what would you do to resolve or help or improve the issues that we just discussed? What do you think needs to be included or excluded? Or what do you think needs to be changed uh, in the profession itself? Let's say you can do anything you want, you know, from, this, from, the, selection of, mm. from the selection of students, all the way to the education that's given in vet college, education that's given after vet college, the focus that's upon, what can we do to improve? Yeah, or I don't know. I don't know if they do any like personality profiling or anything like that at, at sort of um, uh, application stage now for getting into vet college. But as I said, it feels like we're pre-selecting, um, mm -hmm. not meaning to, but we're pre-selecting for people who are going to, um, maybe struggle mentally. Mm. Um, so whether there is um, sort of ideas around that, I don't, again, you know, being 15, 16 years out of college, how I don't know how much of an emphasis there is on, on mental health and, you know, self-care and things like that in college mm. now. I think it's much more talked about. Mm. Um, and I think, I still think that even coming, you know, even having seen practice, even having worked in practice quite before mm. college and during college, I still think I had quite unrealistic expectations of what it would be like. And I don't know how we um, sort of facilitate students to, to kind of see that and to, to, to give them ways to, to cope with that. But, mm -hmm. you know, also things like, I, I still hear people talking about, you know, the fact that they've worked from nine till seven without a lunch break or, mm -hmm. you know, and the additional pressures that practices are under at the moment with all the COVID precautions, you know, it must just be a nightmare being in practice at the moment. I can't imagine the, the, the stress that you all must be under. Um, and I think that, you know, that there is a massive um, underappreciation for, for vets, I think, mm. by the public. Like on the one hand, as you say, they're kind of like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And aren't you lucky? And then on the other hand, there's just this kind of like, what do you mean you can't drop everything and come and see Fluffy now? And no, of course, I haven't got any money. And... Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much for input. Now I'd like to talk more about your new, your new life, so to speak. So, you know, you said you have stopped betting for four to five years. You're a mother of two and you have embraced the whole sustenance, sustainable-ish. Mm. Uh, tell me more about that. So well, how do you transit from being a vet to what gave you the idea in the first place and what have you done so far? Yeah. So um, it was about seven or eight years ago, I read an article, um, the kids were both small, they were still, still um, you know, hadn't started school and things. And I read an article by somebody who was doing something she called her secondhand safari, which was a year buying nothing new. 
And I just thought, oh, that sounds quite fun. And I wonder if we could give that a go. And, and so did and, and set up a blog about it um, and, and blogged every day for the year and kind of rediscovered, actually, I think, I don't know about, I don't know if you found this, but I, I took sciences and maths not because I really enjoyed them, but because I kind of had to, to do them to get into college. And I think mm -hmm. um, I actually really used to enjoy history and writing and all these sorts of things mm -hmm. and actually rediscovered that, you know, I, I really enjoy writing and I really enjoy communicating mm -hmm. with people and um, sort of uh, had some, had some, like you said, had this opportunity to do a TEDx talk during the year, had some, um, some local press, some national press and, um, and, and it just, and obviously it got to the end of the year and I, sort of like well I can't just stop now having gained this momentum and got this mm -hmm. um and so over the the years since then it's sort of morphed into this um what is now a, a sort of I call it sustainable ish so this sort of ethos and this community and it's all about the fact that um you know we need we need to take action we're almost at the point of no return but I think a lot of us are we're very busy um we're overwhelmed already with all the things we've got to do we don't necessarily want to go and live off grid and weave our own lentils you know but actually there are still lots of really easy things we can do and if we can get enough people doing them you know that really does make a difference so mm -hmm. um so yeah that's what I spend my time now doing writing and podcasting and speaking and running courses and all sorts of things that, that is I mean that is pretty amazing I mean uh, coming graduating as a vet and working as a vet and now you're a TEDx speaker and you know you're an author as well you're doing podcasts that is a great amazing transition so if uh, a couple of things. So one is that what if you were to say give three tips for the viewers right now to start their sustainable-ish mm -hmm. lifestyle, what three tips would you give? Um, so absolutely just pick one thing. Don't, you know, you, you kind of think, oh, I need to do this and I need to do this and I need to do this and then you don't do anything. So just pick one thing and mm -hmm. make it as small as you can. So if you want to focus on plastic, um, you know, then pick one thing within plastic. So that might be your milk bottles or that might be your shampoo or that might be. So just just pick one thing and no change is too small. And, and I think there is some curve. I think that the, the first step is the hardest. And then after that, it, you know, it becomes a bit easier. Um, a couple of things that we don't ever really necessarily think about that are really big impact things are to, to move your energy supplier. So look for a renewable tariff and you can do this as a business as well. Um, it can um, shrink your carbon footprint by up to a quarter apparently um, so you know and that's a, like a it sounds the dullest grown upest you know thing to do so we all put it off but actually you do it it takes you half an hour and it's done and you can sit back in your revel in your small carbon footprint or your smaller carbon footprint um, and moving your money is a really really powerful thing to do um, a, the majority of the high street banks are investing in fossil fuels um, so actually, if we can take our money out of them and put them in um, some of the greener banks, so like Triodos, um, the building societies tend to fare a bit better as well. And moving your pension. So, um, you know, we think if we've got a company pension scheme, we're stuck with that particular scheme, but we can ask for it to be um, taken out and ethically invested as well. So those two things are really big bang for your buck. Well, so what, how do you view um, your sustainable-ish movement what are your sort of what, what does the future look like for it what are you hoping to achieve with that um like obviously world domination <laughs> <Sounds good. laughs> um i i i'm con really conscious a lot of the time that i'm preaching to the converted and you know i'm preaching to people who are already on board this journey who are already doing quite a lot of stuff who might even be doing more than me because you know we're not we're not um perfect by any stretch of the imagination um, so you know what I really want to do is to be able to to take that message very much more mainstream to get you know so I've got this knackered mums eco club and the idea is that that will appeal not necessarily to people who are like oh I want to be really green but like god yeah I'm a knackered mum and I want to do my bit and um, so that literally you know there's a there's a quote that says you know we don't need a handful of people doing she talks about zero waste about zero waste perfectly we need millions of people doing it imperfectly and it's exactly the same thing we need i just really want to inspire and empower people to just to just take that first step and then that second step and that third step and um you know and that 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 does mean growing that community and and um getting it out there so that's my plan i don't so, know how it's gonna happen but <laughs> 
slowly, slowly, you know, yes. uh, every every sort of long journey, thousand step journey, being yes. into the single step. I think you've already taken a good few hundred steps. <laughs> so if people want to, if the viewers want to contribute and help or find out more about your organization, uh, what's the best way to do so? so the website is um, asustainablelife.co.uk. And I'm on social media pretty much everywhere at Sustainable-ish. Thank you very much uh, for that, Jen. It's been a complete pleasure. <laughs> been <and> both. <laughs> honor talking to you. And it's great to see you after so many years. Yes. And, and I am fairly, fairly certain. I'm in fact, I'm very, very sure that what you're doing is the right thing and you will get your world domination in the end. <laughs> I do wish you the best of luck. Thank you. No worries. <laughs>